Hello and welcome to the LA Venture Podcast. We're David Waxman and Minnie Ingersoll, partners and investors at 10110. Today's show does not have a sponsor, although if you'd like to sponsor, you can always let me know. It's really easy to sponsor five episodes, but I am looking for a great head of product for one of our really fast growing portfolio companies here in LA. And I'd always love to connect with angels who want to uh, share deal flow and always love to hear from listeners. Reach out to me on LinkedIn. Tom McNerney is one of the most prolific angels in LA with something like 120 angel investments. Tom is an investor in Notion, Segment, Bird, Tala, and recently in a very hot clubhouse round. Before doing angel investing full-time, Tom was an engineer at Apple and then at Sony. Tom, David, thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you. It's great to be here. So Tom, did I, was that a fair characterization of your background and of your angel investing? And do you want to share a little bit more? Sure. Um, so I moved to LA about 12 years ago. I'd come from the Bay Area and I invest both in the Bay Area and Los Angeles and then occasionally in other markets, but really try to concentrate on those two. But it's been kind of amazing to see the evolution of, of LA tech. Very cool. Um, there was a thread on, I guess it was a Twitter thread that said like, name, who's the best angel investor in LA? And everyone said Tom McNerney is. So um, <laughs> glad, to, <laughs> glad to have you on here. Tell us more about like the, the investing that you're doing. Are you usually coming in um, into seed rounds? Is it pre-seed? Will you do later stage? It's often the first money Maybe not the first check, though sometimes the first check, but you know, in the first rounds that, that come together or um, um, subsequent rounds, I occasionally will invest in the A's and B's, but generally try to come in early and, and develop a relationship with the founders in the, in the beginning. And, and just to be clear, this is your money. This isn't a fund of some sort. Correct. Yep. My money, uh, I try to, um, uh, you know, take risks and, and, make early bets it's typically 50 or 100,000 sometimes 25 and um, yeah how did you get started on this path I'd been an entrepreneur and it was pretty exhausting and uh, I wanted to be engaged and involved and so I just started doing it I just uh, started meeting people and and taking pitches I, I think David I shared with you and many as well the, the second angel deal I saw was Airbnb and I I thought, well, I should probably look at a bunch of these before I pull the trigger, which is a, a big regret for me. But um, yeah, it's just you, you just kind of wade into it. What were your first couple? Let's see. Segment was relatively early because uh, it was, I remember it was right when Y Combinator hit, was, it was the early days of Y Combinator. And I remember going to YC, and it's so different now, by the way, you go and there's, last time I went to YC, I just, I didn't even get in the building. The line was so long, I gave up. Um, there were just, I think, th felt like thousands of people, but um, obviously pre-COVID. But back in the day, Y, y Combinator was, it was like some metal folding chairs, maybe 30 metal folding chairs and Paul Graham and his, his wife, Jessica. And, you know, they'd say like, okay, everybody settle down, sit down. And then the entrepreneurs would get started. But I, I happened to catch Segment, and they were doing something totally different. And they ended up going through two pivots. They were doing something back in the day called Class Metric, where in class, students could have their laptops open. And if they didn't understand something during a lecture, they would push a button, and the professor then would become alerted to the fact that, you know, like 20 out of the 30 people in the class weren't. Um, understanding what was going on and he could even have or she could even have a graph of the understanding over time in the lecture and things like that and it turns out when they gave everyone laptops in class everyone just spent time on Facebook and <laughs> the idea didn't work and then they pivoted and tried to make a um, an analytics tool but in order to make the analytics tool uh, they created segment to make it so it was easy to implement the the analytics tool and then everyone's like we don't want your tool we want we want segment. We want the ability to store our data and use lots of different tools. So this is kind of funny how things evolve. Yeah. So many great companies born of pivots. It's a long way from doing a couple angel investments in, in those early days at YC to becoming a, a full-time angel investor. And it is your full-time job, right? It is. Yes, it is. Yep. And, and how long have you been doing it sort of at that level? 
think about 11 years, I mean, from when I got started. And um, this is one of these things where it really is, there's an expression, it's the get rich, slow business. Do you think you've gotten better at it? Um, I mean, hopefully you've gotten better at it. Uh, and, and can you share some of the things you maybe used to look for or used to do that you, you know, you've learned from? That's a great question. I, I've asked myself that question. Am I any better at this than I was in the <laughs> beginning? Um, because it's, it's full of surprises. And we've talked about this um, you, you know, it's full of surprises as soon as you think there's a rule or a uh, kind of a, a perspective or something, you get surprised. And um, for example, with Clubhouse, you'd, you'd mentioned that one. I, <laughs> I very nearly didn't do that. We, COVID had just begun and, um, and then the team there were focused on consumer and social and, you know, looking from the outside, it, it definitely had a lot of headwinds. It didn't have a lot going for it. And I almost said no, but I was so impressed with Paul Davison. He was the person I interacted with most. And I decided to invest because he was just clearly super sharp. But I think your gut uh, gets a little more fine-tuned over time. And you're probably maybe better at coming up with quick no's or, or, or maybe estimating a market size. Can you tell me more about Clubhouse? So I'm curious. So number one, I still don't have my invitation. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I'll, and I'll I know David that. hangs out. Thank you. David hangs out there. What makes it so special for, for the most of our listeners who are not yet on Clubhouse? Yeah, I think in the end, they, they had pretty good timing with COVID where people weren't able to go out and socialize. So it's a pretty social place. You go into Clubhouse, you start the app, and you can either join a room or start a room. And then in, within the room, you have the kind of the microphone when you start a room and you can invite people up to speak. And then you have an audience and they can raise their hand if they want to, if they have something to add. But it's incredibly simple. It's only audio. Um, and we just talked about that in the beginning of this call. Vi you know, video adds an extra kind of cognitive load. And so it's audio. So you can be, you know, in your bathrobe or your underwear and, and just having a conversation or in bed or something with someone. And there are people that join from lots of different time zones, for example. Um, and it's dead simple to use and it allows people to connect. And I think they also did a nice job with the co initial community that they've curated. So, you know, it's, it's, there've been some kind of knocks on it for being invitation only or whatever, but I think what that's allowed them to do is control the community so that they just have a good energy to start. And that kind of sets the tempo for the, for any kind of social network. I think your initial community kind of sets the feeling and the vibe and uh, that's important. I've been very curious about how it's going to scale from here. Me too. It's really, I mean, it's the first minute of the first quarter for this business. It's, it's really, you know, the hard work in terms of scaling it and, and making it work well. I've heard Paul say that, you know, they're really super focused on making it so speakers or people that are talking have a, a secure environment and a, a good experience so that if they attract good speakers, they feel like the audiences will follow. And I think that's probably true. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to work on my invite there. And so so Clubhouse was a hot round. As I understand it, I wasn't part of it, but, you know, multiple VCs wanted to lead that. Um, how do you get involved? Like, does an entrepreneur seek you out? Do you sometimes say, oh, this is a company I really want to be a part of? Well, this one, I got lucky. I, I was involved before it got hot. Um, and then incredibly, a month later, it got hot, which is, and it was like a, you know, a 10x on paper in like, it might, might be one of my best IRRs ever, but the way I do it, the way I get involved in cool companies is just to have a, a network of people that are close that I check in with. And um, oftentimes, you know, the things come through that. And so I think having a network of good founders and it was another founder that made the introduction originally. Got it. Um, it's kind of an interesting uh, company of our time too, as you said, like it probably benefited from the fact that we are all locked in our houses right now. You know, what do you think about the current times we're in and how that will in, uh, affect your investing? I, I, I had a, a, a thesis going into COVID and now a different, pretty significantly different thesis months later. The initial thesis was like, oh my goodness, this is like the Lehman Brother shock or the mm. you know the the 2009 financial crisis or 
or the Great Depression, I, th I was very um, pessimistic, thought people would be locked in their homes and businesses would be shut. And, you know, the federal government has done a good job, I think, with stimulus. I sort of modified my thesis when tech stocks started going up and, and, and sort of saw that the, instead of a withdrawal from markets, there was more of a shifting. And so the shifting went from airlines and casinos and commercial real estate and industrial companies and probably minerals and other other things into tech companies, things like DocuSign and Twilio and uh, Datadog. And so in the end, there wasn't necessarily an outflow in the markets, but rather a shift into tech. And so my new thesis is this is the, this is the comet that killed the dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And it is accelerating a lot of the secular trends that were already happening. For example, you know, watching movies at home and streaming and remote work, you know, Things like DocuSign, where you just do electronic signatures instead of go in and see a notary and sign, sign a bunch of paper. So uh, more and more, my feeling is that this is going to accelerate things that were already happening. Um, and so it, it's, it's made me, initially I was very conservative, but, but now I'm actually more and more bullish on tech. Um, so it's, uh, it's probably going to accelerate my angel investing. Hmm. Yeah. I think we're generally with you. Like there's a lot of uh, slow moving industries that are all of a sudden <laughs> having to be faster moving. Right. Mm, exactly. That's right. And, and don't, and, and it's forcing them, you know, they were able to sort of kick the can down the road on digital, take a company like Disney. They make a lot of money from movie releases. They make a lot of money from theme parks. They make a lot of money from selling toys. But when all that stuff goes away, it makes them really concentrate on Disney Plus and digital and digital initiatives. So um, I, think, I think, yes, that, that this actually forces a lot of companies to accelerate the move to and the shift to pure digital. How do you think it affects our lives? Um, so that's, that's a good perspective from what you might invest in. But if we're now doing a lot more digital and we're, we're not going into the office nine to five, five days a week, how do our lives change? <laughs> we are inherently social and I think we need to be social. I think one thing I've noticed with a lot of friends is this, um, and myself included, we, there's kind of a reconnection with nature as well and an appreciation of nature as we talked about, I'm a bit of an environmentalist. And, uh, uh, but I mean, I think some of the challenges are for people whose jobs were lo are lost. You know, this has been very hard on a number of different industries. And I think it can potentially accelerate the gap in, in income inequality and, and a number of other issues. And I'd like to see tech address that if we can. And um, yeah, I, I was overall initially pretty impressed with how people came together and then in the end, it was sort of, there was sort of, you know, the riots and the, and then, you know, there was also, I think, I think COVID kind of pressurized society. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's talk some about Black Lives Matter because I'd love to know, you know, some about the conversations that you're having. I think a lot of these things that were happening and not being recorded, a pr police brutality and, 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 and so forth are now being recorded such that you know, that, that's a good thing, right? We want, we, if citizens are being abused by officials, uh, then that, that needs to be stopped. And that needs, first we need to know it's even happening. And so, um, you know, you take something that would have been a he said, she said, and then all of a sudden you have it on video and it's clear as day what happened, then uh, that, that does change the game. So it's a, it's a democratizing factor yeah. You said something, um, you said tech can help. And I think you were talking some more about the um, situation with COVID and, and unemployment, but I'd be curious to dig in on where you see that tech can help beyond just the, the fact that we all have, have cameras on our cell phones. Yeah, it's, it's, I like this idea of distributed work. I like this idea. Imagine, you know, in the future, some period in, in, in time, you wake up and you just kind of morphed into the future and you have, you know, you could walk up to a vending machine, buy a cell phone and you didn't know anyone, but you, you know, with that cell phone, you could start doing work, um, whether it's, you know, classification stuff for artificial intelligence or image classification or, you know, different mechanical Turk stuff or, or gig economy work. 
I like the idea of the of the phone empowering, you know, distributed uh, work. Uh, you you asked me a question uh, over email about uh, gig work, and uh, I'm a fan of gig work because I I think ultimately it provides a lot of flexibility, and I've spoken to gig workers. So I, I think there it, it can make for a more elastic employment uh, situation. And it can maybe democratize opportunity if it's done well. Yeah, I mean, I think I saw that you posted something about AB5, the 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 California's push for gig workers to be classified as full-time employees. It's a tricky one, right? Because I agree with you, gig work can be very empowering, but how do you still protect workers to make sure that they, you know, aren't working 40, 50 hours a week and still not able to support themselves? Right. I guess one simple answer is, if they if there was a better job, they'd be choosing that other job. So if you're gig working, like it or not, your alternative is unemployment, right? The better job would be the one they'd be doing otherwise. And the worst thing down from that could be unemployment. So I'd say it's better than unemployment. Um, and my, my concern would be that if you, if you, I mean, I've been an Uber shareholder. I ended up, I'm no longer an Uber shareholder. But it, they're losing money. So I don't see that they necessarily can start to afford to pay benefits and things like that. There's a devil's advocate argument that if everybody is subject to the same regulation, then maybe those companies can charge more. And, and yes, consumers can decide whether they can still afford it and pay more or not. I, I, and I would agree with you on that. I think that consumers could pay more. And perhaps those companies have been too obsessed with growth, for example. So perhaps they modulate their growth, they charge more, and they pay workers more fairly. Yeah, I'm, I'm open to that as an alternative. So I don't want to get too into the political stuff. I just, mm. I was kind of hung up on this like future whereby I'm walking, like I wake up in the morning and I just like walk over to a vending machine and it like, it dispenses my job for the day. For sure. Yeah. You could go to the app store and choose what you want and what you like and that would be something I'd love to see tech enable. Cool. Um, maybe choosing sort of other things that you commonly invest in. Um, I know you've done a lot in, uh, in AI ML recently. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. There's actually one that just very similar to what we talked about. And it was kind of an example. I used a, a machine learning classification system. It's an X, uh, SpaceX team, former SpaceX team that's building a system where people can do uh, image classification that's, that's basically training for, um, training for machine learning and class, you know, classification to b help build neural nets for AI and you, and you get paid to do it. And actually, I like that the founder, founder used an example. He said, you, you get in line at the grocery store with no money in your wallet and you start working at this and then by the time you're at the front of the line you have enough money to buy a sandwich or something that's probably a little bit exaggerated but i i think there's there's some neat stuff like that and i've looked at recently a company doing synthetic data which is generating like data that is used to train neural networks that's synthetic which is helpful because for privacy reasons you sometimes don't want to be using real data and uh so i i think there's a lot of promise there it's still definitely early days though yeah. No, it's interesting to see which industries are really going to adopt AI. And again, it's all about having that proprietary data set or creating it, as you say. Yeah, I was going to ask sort of back to investing. There are some investors who, who you know, really like I, w I would call us this kind of investor who really look for markets that have tailwinds in them. And yet, um, you, you know, you invest in Clubhouse, which you said had, had big headwinds. Yeah, I would say that I almost don't look for tailwinds. I look for the weird stuff um, or things that are, are different and strange, things that are, I don't know, things that are out of favor. I, I was doing a lot of clean tech investing over the last many years. And, and there were, you know, at least five years ago, I'd say clean tech was pretty out of favor three years ago. And it's getting more in favor now, but it's hard to even get Sand Hill VCs to look at clean tech it is tempting now, for example, just to continue to do SaaS companies like Notion or Segment because they, they just work, when they work, they do work really well. But I, I, I try to find the next sort of strange thing that, that becomes, you know, important. I mean, I've had friends that were buying Bitcoin when it was, it seemed very strange. And uh, so I, I think you're, 
for me, I sort of challenge myself to think of, of stuff that's a little more off the beaten path. Why can't we all just in, invest in clean tech? Um, one, just because we all just care about it. David's also off in nature right now. Uh, you know, and, and so the problem is I care so much about it, but where do you think the interesting opportunities to invest in clean tech or just in the environment are? Yeah, I think carbon, there will be eventually markets for carbon. And so I think that's going to be one that's ultimately big and important. I think a lot about materials, for example, you know, it's hard to live your life without using plastic, especially now. In fact, with COVID, it seems to have gone up. But, you know, the one-time use plastics are, are frustrating to me to think, wow, I just took a bottle of water and, and this, this thing's going to be around for like 200 years in a landfill, or it's going to break down into microplastics and end up in seafood or, the, the, you know, the water we drink and things. So I think the, the consumables and the waste stream uh, there's a ton of opportunity to do innovation there. So let's um, let's sort of move into our final stuff, which is just like more about Tom's section here. Um, Tom, I'm really interested in this aspect that you are a full-time angel investor. I just don't meet many people who are doing that. When you think about your your days and your time, how do you are there are there activities that you feel like you spend too much of your time on? And kind of the the converse of that is. Are there things you don't spend enough time on? And how do you really hold yourself accountable? That's a great question. I feel like I spend sometimes too much time on the little things in life. I mean, during COVID, I felt like I was just constantly doing dishes, <laughs> uh, <laughs> like three meals a day, basically. But uh, and, and I'd like to spend more time just thinking, um, just really purely thinking about ideas. And I find when I take walks, it's very helpful to think. But um, I'd love to be having more great conversations like these uh, over the phone. So I, I think there's just a certain amount of overhead to keep your life, keep all the plates spinning in your life that you, you spend time on. So I love a little more thinking and writing time, perhaps, and a little less time doing dishes. <laughs> <laughs> great. David, anything else from you? Uh, or Tom, anything else you think um, would be really useful to cover? No, it's, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Um, it's, it's been fun to see you know, the evolution of LA and, and I'm so great, grateful to have you guys in the ecosystem and, and thanks for having me on the show. Oh, great. No, I mean, you're doing so much for the ecosystem and you've been doing it for a long time and um, it's great to get the chance to sit down with you.